This morning we're going to jump into uh, our journey through the book of Philippians. Uh, We've been walking through this letter uh, for the last few weeks, and uh, our theme has been we're all in this together. This short letter in the New Testament, penned by the Apostle Paul, has been dubbed by some the Epistle of Joy. Uh, By others, it's called the Letter of Excellence. It is chock full of memorable passages, some of which have already, we've already come across. Those passages we likely memorized as kids in Sunday school because Philippians is an intensely practical book. It is a incredibly encouraging book. I am so grateful that these words have been recorded for us and that Paul decided he wanted to pen these words to a church in Philippi and that thousands of years later we draw encouragement from it. If you haven't taken time yet to read all four chapters, it wouldn't take you very long to get through the entire book. Can I encourage you to do that this week? To just take maybe one chapter a day and let that kind of sink into your heart over the next four days. We are smack in the middle of chapter two this morning. If you need to get caught up, um, each message, the last three messages were about 30 minutes long. Uh, You can find them on YouTube under the Grace Community channel, or if you just go straight to our website, you can find a link to them there. This morning, we're going to take a look at what it means to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and to shine like stars. So let's get into the passage. We're looking at Verse 12 of chapter 2. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. He writes, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We're going to go a little farther this morning, but let's hit pause for a moment. One of the reasons why I love this letter so much is because of the overall tone of the letter. He begins this passage with, my dear friends. You know how when you open up a book, you read the first couple of lines, and if, especially if it's a, you know, a suspense kind of novel, you know within the first couple of words what you're going to be getting into, and you, you kind of get hooked in. If you're a Dickens fan, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Oh man, I'm hooked. Where, where are we going with this? Or you get an email from a good friend, and within the first couple of words, you know, okay, this is an email of joy. They're sharing some good news with me. Or you know, within the first couple of moments, oh man, something's gone wrong. And you know that you're going to be, the tone of the letter is just immediately evident. Well, that's what this book is like. Philippians is just chock full of terms of endearment and signs of Paul's affection for this church in Philippi. It oozes encouragement and it, you just feel grace all over it. We catch another one of those moments here when he says, my dear friends, this is the great apostle Paul. This is the one who planted so many churches through the known world. He doesn't go in with his title. He doesn't go in with all of his credentials. He says, my dear friends, Therefore, my dear friends, you can hear his pastor's heart in these words. They're not what's going to follow are probably not harsh words of correction, which we realize Paul was not scared to use if you read some of his other letters. But he's going to be following this up with some tender words of encouragement. My dear friends, you know, pretty much anything he says after this is likely going to land pretty deep in people's hearts. I find it much easier to accept encouragement or correction or even rebuke from somebody that I know loves me. Knowing that someone cares about my well-being, that wants to see me grow, they can speak into my life in significant ways. Starting off a sentence like this, if Paul said, my dear friend, he could probably tell me just about anything. And the encouragement that he gives is pretty interesting. He starts with, therefore, my dear friends... Basic hermeneutics that I learned back in Bible college. If you see the word therefore, you must ask, what's it there for? Um, What is therefore referring to? Therefore is referring to the chapter that we just came out of, or the passage we just came out of, where Paul goes through this description of Jesus as this incredible servant, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or snatched at, but instead 
made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because we have this example of who Jesus is, of his obedience, of his servant heart, of his downward mobility, therefore, our attitude should be the same as his. Because we see this incredible example in the person of Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider that to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Because we've seen that, we too should continue in that obedience. Because he was obedient to death, we, as we have always obeyed, should continue to work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. This is a very interesting phrase. The idea of working out your salvation. Because I don't know what pops into your mind when you hear the word salvation. But the first thing that I think of is the life-saving work that Jesus accomplishes for us. Salvation is a gift from God. We do nothing to earn it. It is purely God's grace in our lives. We were dead, in sin, without hope. Jesus said, I want you back. So he paves the way for us to be back in right relationship with the Father. Yes, we come to him and we ask for forgiveness and we invite him into our lives. But salvation is a gift from God. The salvation experience, how do you work that out? How do you work out salvation? Well, I'm not sure that Paul is talking only about that instant where we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, where we become saved. I think he's talking about how that salvation gets played out for the rest of your life. See, that moment is really important, but it's not the complete picture of what salvation is all about. In theological terms, we might see it as the difference between justification and sanctification. Yes, we're justified before God, but that relationship has to be played out for longer than just a single prayer. I know justification, sanctification, big fancy highfalutin Bible college words. Let me... Let me break this down a little bit for you. I heard a pretty good analogy this week. Imagine one of you decided to give me a mansion. I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. (laughs) You never know. I'm just planting some seeds here. (laughs) Let's say you decided to gift me a mansion. Could you imagine? No, I can't even imagine. You give me a mansion and you transfer the deed of ownership over to me and I own it outright. No strings attached. It is completely mine. You say, this is now yours. I own this mansion. There's no liens against the property. There's no discussion of how I'm going to pay you back. It's, this is my gift to you. Not rent to own. You just say, here is 60,000 square feet of mansion. And all I can do is say thank you. Now this is what I see salvation as. It is an incredible gift, more than we could ever, ever deserve. Nothing we could do to earn it or warrant it. It is an absolute gift. And we receive it by faith. It's not by works. There's no talk of us paying it back. But in order to truly make that mansion mine, I have to move in. I have to live in that mansion. I don't truly know what that mansion is all about until I walk through those doors and start looking around in each one of the rooms and deciding how I might want to maybe decorate or what furniture I place in each room, whose bedroom is going to belong to whom, and where are we going to host our dinner parties. See, I may have the deed, but until I actually go into that mansion, I've not really lived it out. When you think about our salvation, until we actually start allowing it to impact our daily life, we're not truly living it out. I think sometimes people reduce Christianity to standing in the courtyard looking at the house. We know a lot about Jesus. We know a lot about who God is. We, we see the mansion. We dis- discuss its beautiful architecture. But we don't live there. It doesn't significantly impact our daily lives. It's as if we stand on the front line and admire its beauty, but never set foot inside. We know a lot about what a relationship with Jesus looks like, but we don't actually enter into one. 
There are others who maybe walk in the front door and they look in that grand entrance. They see the spiral staircase and they see a chair sitting just beside the door and decide, this is perfect. I'm just going to hang out right here and look at this beautiful mansion. There's, I bet there's dozens of rooms here, but never leaving the safety of that entrance. They don't bother to explore the riches of the mansion. They're happy to just be inside, out of the cold and in the house. But to venture beyond the front hall is not something they care to do. They don't go from room to room discovering just how incredible this gift is. Sure, they pray the prayer. They invite Jesus in. They cross that threshold, but that's where it ends for them. Justified, but still falling short of what God's plan and God's dream for their life would be. Because this gift is really so much more than that. See, salvation is not something we earn, but it is something that we walk out. When Paul says you need to work out your salvation, it means that yes, God has given us a gift, but it's up to us to allow that gift to influence and affect every aspect of our lives. Salvation by its very nature is complete, and it is God's absolute gift to us. But that gift needs to be applied daily, to our experience as believers. I read a great quote by a guy named Jacobus, which I kind of wish was my name. Jacobus, Jacobus Muller. He said, we must work out what God by his grace has worked in. What he's already worked in us, we now must work out. We're justified by accepting the work that Jesus did on the cross. Positionally, we are made right with God. But now we must experience that salvation on a regular basis. We have to walk it out. For this is God's ultimate purpose for us. That we learn to walk more in step with the Spirit. That we accurately reflect the image of His Son. That we become more loving, more peaceful, more patient, more compassionate. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So work out your salvation. How often does this cross your mind? How often do you think about the process of becoming more like Jesus? Because this is what discipleship is. Discipleship is becoming more like your master. That when the disciples followed Jesus, uh, there was an old saying that uh, you may the dust of your ra- a rabbi be all over your clothes. Uh, that you were walking so closely to your rabbi that the dust from his sandals would kick up all over you. When you were a disciple, you wanted to know exactly what your rabbi, the way he did everything. Uh, They would wash, watch the way that a rabbi would wash his hands and they would copy that. I'm going to wash my hands exactly the same way that my rabbi does. When the rabbi would pray a prayer of blessing over a child, they would intently watch the way that he did that and they they would copy, they would model that. Disciples wanted to be just like their rabbi. How often do we think about working out our salvation or what this discipleship process looks like for us? How are we becoming more like Jesus on a regular basis? What steps could you take that would move you in the right direction, even today? How could you become a little bit more like Jesus this week? How could you work out your salvation a little bit with some fear and trembling? That's another interesting phrase. Work out your salvation, okay, and we kind of got to the bottom of that a little bit, but with fear and trembling... This isn't a contradiction to the, like, joyful stuff we've been hearing so far in this letter. It's not a fear like terror or fright. It's not the same feeling I gave Tara the other day. Oh, man, I asked her permission to share this, so. (laughs) The other day we were in the office, and we were in need of a short extension cord to plug in a calculator. And so our offices are just over here, and the hallway runs kind of the length of the sanctuary. So I stepped out of the office and I turned right to come through these doors here back to the sound booth where the extension cords would be hanging. Tara didn't realize that I had gone looking for an extension cord and so she, at the same time, walked out of the office and turned left to come in through the back to where the extension cords would be hanging. Now the light switches for this space are back in that little room. So I could see clearly from the daylight coming in from the front. So I just walked through the dark and went up into the sound booth and proceeded to retrieve an extension cord. And rather than bothering to turn on the lights in the room, I just looked over and I saw white, which meant that was a little extension cord. And so I grabbed the extension cord. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Tara has made her way down the hallway and is coming through the back door there. And just as I grabbed the extension cord and turned, the door opened 
And Tara sees me standing there holding an extension cord in pitch darkness. (laughs) She may have screamed. Her heart may still have been racing five minutes later in the office. There was some fear and trembling for Tara the other morning. Now, this is not the type of fear and trembling that Paul's talking about. It's not the same thing as having your wits scared out of you or having somebody jump up behind you out of a dark corner. The phrase with fear and trembling might be better translated in our language with a word like reverence and responsibility. With with a deep sense that this gift that's been given to us requires some attention and requires us to tremble even at the thought of our own sin. I don't think that it's a fear that worries that we're going to be cast out of the mansion. I don't think that it's a fear that worries that somehow we're going to not be able to pay back this incredible gift that's been given to us. But it's a fear that takes care to respect this gift that's been given. This was not given to us easily. Our salvation was bought and paid for by the death of God's own son. And that death was not a pleasant death. It was not anything easy. I think sometimes when we think of Jesus as being the son of God, we think of him being God, we don't realize how painful that cross would have been for a human being as Jesus was to go through on our behalf. So working out our salvation with fear and trembling means that we don't take sin lightly. Maybe when we think about our mansion, we realize that when we walk in, we are meant to take care of this space. We are meant to clean it. We are meant to make sure that it doesn't fall into disrepair. We maybe will choose to decorate it rather tastefully rather than just throw a wild party and trash the place. Because we realize we've been given an incredible gift and the best way to honor that gift is to live like the one who gave it to us to look for ways to pass that same gift on to others. Granted, we won't be able to give everybody a mansion, but maybe it means we invite others into our space. We throw parties where we tell the story of the incredible gift that's been given to us. The fear that Paul is talking about is this holy awe, this reverence for this grace that's been given to us. And we don't take it lightly. It's not terror. It is a holy fear. Our fear is not that God's going to judge us and cast us out, but it's a reverence for what that gift cost him. To shudder at the thought of our own sin and to turn from it. To realize that when we're left to our own devices, we ruin things. I have a good friend that when we were discussing why she's still a Christian, she said she's had lots of opportunities where she's thought, you know what, maybe this isn't worth following. She told me that one day she just came to the realization that if I was left to my own devices, I make a mess of everything. And I need somebody in my life who is going to lead me in a better way. And it's true. If we're left to our own devices, to our own selfishness, we will make a mess of everything. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling because this is an incredible gift of God. I love the way that this verse wraps up. It says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Oh man, that's another good bit of news right there. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Be in awe of who God is and this gift that he's given you and respect that gift enough to work out the sin and muck in your life. But you're not doing it alone. It's not even your job to get rid of it all by yourself. Even in the midst of our working things out with fear and trembling, God is at work in us. It's comforting to me that God doesn't ask me to do anything he's not already equipped me to do. He'll not ask me to do something that's impossible. It may not be easy. It may not be fun. But it will be possible with him at work in my life. So as we surrender to God, inviting him to do this work in us, it's his spirit that prompts and nudges us. It's his spirit that can fix us when we choose to go our own way. When we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, he works in our hearts to accomplish his will, to make us more like himself. That phrase, works in you, is the Greek word there is where we get the word, English word, energy from. 
this idea that there's this energy, this, this substance about what's going on inside of us that makes us want to move forward and accomplish his purpose. And it's God's energy alive and working in us. It's not our own. It's not anything we drum up. Because sometimes our will alone is not enough to see significant change in us. I don't know if you've ever said, this is the last time I'm ever doing this. Only to two days later be asking God to forgive you. It is the work of God. He gives us the energy to continue that fight. It's essentially a partnership that we enter into in which our partner happens to have unlimited resources, unlimited strength, and unlimited will to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in us. Pretty good deal for us. What it requires, though, is us submitting, being willing to walk across the threshold and move into that mansion. So how is God at work in you as you work out your salvation? Where do you see his fingerprints in your life? Where is he convicting you? Where is he encouraging? How are you becoming more like Jesus as he does this work in your heart? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God that's at work in you. Let's carry on. Paul continues to write, he says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I cannot tell you how many times we have quoted this to our kids. (laughs) Please go vacuum the basement and do everything without grumbling or arguing. Perhaps taking a little bit out of context. But Brandon and I used to say on, also on a regular basis, whining is not cool. So it when, it's really hard to say that to a two-year-old that's not really understanding what you're saying. But <laughs> Grumbling and arguing. Nobody likes being around somebody that is always grumbling or somebody that is argumentative. You wouldn't want to be part of a church that operates like that. You don't like being around other people who are lacking in joy and looking for a fight. But there is something attractive about a group of people that get along. There's something that speaks to people's hearts in the midst of unity. When people are united, when they're not grumbling or arguing, there is this sense that there's no fingers to be pointed. Blameless and pure. Often people do point a finger at the church and say, well, they can't even get along with each other. Why would I want to be a part of something like that? Scripture also says how good and pleasant it is when people dwell in unity. Because unity removes that blemish. It helps us to stand out when when we choose to serve one another, when we choose to love one another. It says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. It's interesting here, he doesn't doesn't tell them to shine. He doesn't encourage them to shine or command them to shine. He just reminds them that they already do. When you do this, you're going to shine. As followers of Jesus, who is the light of the world, we represent and replicate and reflect that same light. We, in turn, shine like stars. We reveal a different way of life. We, We shine. We make them wonder what's going on in our lives. As the newsboy said, make them wonder what you got. Followers of Jesus should be the most attractive people in the world. And not attractive in the sense of our media obsession with youth and outward beauty. I mean attractive in the sense that when you see someone who follows Jesus closely, you want what they have. You want to experience that same joy and peace because they shine like stars. There are a handful of people that I have either read or have watched um, them follow Jesus that I just, I can't wait to have a conversation with them one day about what it meant to follow Jesus so closely. When I look at a life like Rich Mullins, who could have could have been a millionaire, could have just, I mean, he wrote Awesome God, he wrote just a number of tunes that would have put him into superstardom, and yet he built a house on a reserve in the States and taught music to poor children. Every time he got on stage, he wore jeans, a t-shirt, and no shoes. He was in bare feet. And on his tombstone, it says, there's a ragamuffin loose on the streets of gold. He's barefoot. He's dancing. He's home. 
could have gone for all the fame and glory and fortune, yet chose to follow Jesus in downward mobility. That's attractive to me. I want to know Jesus the way Rich knew Jesus. I want to work out my salvation and shine. Because the world needs to see a different way. The world needs to see this light. They, they need to see hope. They need to see love. They need to see grace. The, the language he uses there, he puts in brackets, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. He's hearkening back to some of the Old Testament passages that described what the world was like after the sin of Adam and our rebellion. When we choose our own way, the arrogance and folly of disobedience, when we decide to walk away from God and go our own direction. You don't have to look far to find darkness in the world. Turn on the news and I guarantee you'll hear story after story of where darkness seems to reign, where there seems to be little light. Well, that's where we need to be. That's where the church needs to be. That's where Christians need to be, bringing light into dark places, bringers of hope and peace and love. When we hold firmly to the word of life, living out this good news, embodying the gospel, we shine like stars. People will notice something different about us when we choose to live according to God's ways. Because that's God's plan. God's plan is for us to reveal his goodness and grace. Reflecting mercy and love to a world that has often experienced judgment and hate. When you walk out of those doors... This afternoon, you have the opportunity to bring life into the world. And you can choose to allow God to so work in and through you that people experience grace and love in tangible ways. Our lives can reflect the good work that the Spirit is doing in us. And when we do, we shine like stars. And people are drawn to that. People want to experience that. So do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you can become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you'll shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word. Paul wraps up this little bit here with, and then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ Jesus that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Here again, we hear Paul's pastor's heart. He'll boast in their faithfulness. He rejoices in the fruit that is in their lives because they're a product of his own faithfulness. They only know the good news because Paul shared it with them. He has this investment in their lives. And even if his life is being poured out, even if he doesn't end up getting out of this Roman prison, even if these chains that he's in for the gospel end up being the last place he takes a breath, he's making an internal investment. Eternal investment. I love this idea of investing in others. Over the past few years, I've attempted to live my life according to a rhythm or or rule of life. Uh, I I like having a little bit of structure uh, to kind of keep me focused on things. And so one of the things that I've chosen to live my life based on is, a, is an acrostic lives. And so what I try to do during my week, uh, even during my day, is take time to listen to God, to invest in others, to be versed in truth, to eat with others, and see myself as sent into the world. Every week I want to spend at least one hour in quiet reflection listening for the voice of God. I want to invest in at least two people. I want to find two tangible ways that I can pour into the lives of others. I've tried to shape this around one person who already knows Jesus and one person who doesn't yet know him. First, in truth, I I spend time reading at least three things that challenge me. So one of those is always scripture. One is some sort of devotional reading that will challenge my own heart. And then one is just, right now I'm reading a book on creativity by the, uh, by the president of Pixar who did cars and toys and all those things and talking about how to, how to manage creativity, something that challenges my thinking. And then I eat with at least two people during the week. Usually that ends up being over coffee. Same idea, one person who knows Jesus and one who doesn't. And then all of these things are wrapped up in seeing myself as sent into this world. I exist not for myself. I exist to serve others. 
And the first two of these things are mentioned in Paul's passage here, to to listen to God, to allow him to work out this stuff in us, and then to invest in others. See, my faith should be being reproduced in the lives of other people because I can't be living only for myself. I need to live for the sake of other people as well. My faith shouldn't only bear fruit in my own life, but needs to be bearing fruit in the lives of those around me. Because sometimes I can get so focused on working out my own salvation that I forget about those around me and the journey that they're on. So how, like the Apostle Paul, could I be poured out this week? How could I invest in someone else? I rejoice when I hear of someone digging into Scripture because of something they heard me say or saw me do, even if it is to challenge me on what I happen to say. I remember doing a baptism for one of the youth uh, in Carmen, and uh, he was one of those kids that sat in the back during youth and never paid attention. I actually threw a tennis ball at him and his buddy because they were talking during one of my messages. And uh, I remember thinking, this kid's not getting anything out of it. And then the day that he got baptized, he got up, and when he was sharing his testimony, he shared three points from a sermon that I had preached six months earlier that had spoken to him, that had challenged his heart. We don't always realize the investment that we're making. But I rejoiced on that day when I was like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have thrown a tennis ball at him. (laughs) (laughs) When somebody's being more loving because of something they witnessed or, or heard in my own life that challenged them, that brings joy to my heart. And that's what Paul was saying. He didn't want to run or labor in vain. He didn't want to have invested in these people only to have them fall away and to not live out their full potential. As a pastor, that's what I want for this congregation. I want each of you to experience Jesus in a way that he changes your life in every aspect. I want you to experience what it's like to be able to use your gifts and your abilities to pour into somebody else's life. There is nothing more rewarding than seeing somebody else blessed because God worked through you. So who are you pouring into right now? Who are you investing in on a regular basis? Who could you pour into this week? Can I challenge you to find two people to pour into this week? Maybe it means grabbing a cup of coffee. Maybe it means sending an email or a note of encouragement. Maybe it means that when you're already having a conversation with someone, you listen to that still small voice of the Spirit that would say, you know what? They need to hear this. I wasn't planning on sharing this part, but uh, last fall, I ran into a friend that I had gone to Bible college with. He was sitting outside Starbucks in Osborne Village. We're good friends. We connect every once in a while. Uh, But I saw him sitting there, and he was reading. Uh, I know he's a pastor, so he's probably studying, and I didn't really want to interrupt him. So I just walked up to him, and I put my arms around him, and I gave him a great big squeeze, and then I kissed him on top of the head. And then I walked away, and I was like, why did I just kiss him on top of the head? Like, if you know me, that's not, that's not me. And I, I walked away, I'm like, I'm an idiot. What was that? I got a text message within a couple of hours that what he had been reading and what he had been kind of wrestling with, he was really needing God to show up and remind him that he was loved and that, um, that he was God's chosen man for that job. And he said, I broke down sitting at that stupid Starbucks table when you kissed me on top of the head. I was like, okay, so sometimes I'll, I'm willing to look like a fool to invest in the life of somebody else. But maybe you know somebody who's going through a diff- difficult time right now. Maybe you could make plans this week to spend some time together to see how you could maybe bring some strength to them. Maybe it means making supper for them. Maybe it means babysitting their kids, finding ways to invest in the lives of others because we can do it in really practical ways. See, Paul saw the church in Philippi as an investment in the kingdom. He rejoiced to see them being obedient and following Jesus. And so he encouraged them to rejoice along with him that they were all in this together. So this week... Can I encourage you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling and to shine like stars. We're currently in the season of Lent. It began on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday and continues right through till Easter. And I realize that there may be some of you who don't participate in this particular season of the traditional church calendar, and that's totally fine. Others of you may find this a very meaningful time of preparation. Growing up in the Anglican church and kind of pushing that sort of tradition aside for a while, 
As I get a little older, I realize some of the richness of some of that tradition. So Advent is a huge thing in my life, preparing for the birth of Jesus. And Lent has also become that for me. Because in the same way that I prepare for this birth of Jesus, I also want to spend some time contemplating his death and resurrection. And there are typically, typically three practices that go on during Lent. And most of you will be familiar with the giving up of something. Usually it's chocolate or ice cream <laughs> or some other snack that's maybe not all that great for us. In the past, I've chosen to, to give up... Um, well, I've chosen to do 40 days of solidarity with the poor. So I actually gave up food for 40 days a couple of years ago. Not food entirely, but I only ate one meal a day and only ingredients that uh, could be found on the table of a person in a developing country. So I ate a lot of beans. I ate a lot of rice. Um, this year I've decided I'm going to give up sleep. And uh, not entirely, <laughs> but I'm going to give up an extra half hour. An extra half hour that I would normally just kind of hit snooze or would set the alarm a little bit later. I'm going to give up an extra half hour of sleep to pray and to begin each morning in prayer. For many people, the giving up thing is all that they do for length, but the purpose of the sacrifice of giving something up is to plant something new. It's sort of like pulling a weed. If you just pull the weed and don't plant anything else there, another weed is probably going to grow up. So pull the weed and plant something new. So I'm taking sleep out for half an hour and I'm going to put prayer in. So even if you don't fast from anything for Lent, even if this season is not something that you want to participate in, can I encourage you to add a little discipline in your life this coming weeks? To work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To figure out what would God want to do in and me that would help me become more like Jesus as I prepare to celebrate Easter? How could I shine a little bit more brightly in my workplace or my neighborhood, reflecting his goodness to the world. I said there were three things, the giving up and then the adding something new. The third one that is probably the least talked about is the practice of almsgiving, that ideally we give, we're more generous during the time of Lent, especially to the poor. So just as a PS at the end of the message, that might be one way to reflect Jesus to the world around you. Find a way to bless the poor. So to quote Paul one more time, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then you'll shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad. And I rejoice with you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. I thank you, God, for the incredible gift of salvation. That there are no strings attached. That there is nothing we could do to earn it. There is nothing we could do to warrant or even pay back this incredible gift. Even if we work out our salvation, even if we strive to become perfect, we know we're never going to fully achieve perfection on this side of heaven. So we don't do it to earn your favor or your love. We don't attempt to become more like you out of some sense of duty or this is what is required of us. We do it out of love because this gift that has been given is really too much. It is more than we would ever dream of or deserve. And so we invite you by your spirit to continue the work in us, to mold and shape us, to stir us, where there are things in our hearts that are keeping us from experiencing greater freedom or greater love or greater peace. God, would you reveal those to us and help us to work through those things, to walk them out. Where your spirit needs to convict, I pray that you would be free to do that.
You give us ears to hear. Give us lives that are sensitive enough to realize that when we fall short, it's okay to say that we're sorry and to choose a different direction. For it's you that's at work in us, and we're grateful for it. So help us this week as we, we really want to shine. We want people to see your goodness in us. We want people to understand what grace looks like. We want people to feel your love moving through us. So help us to invest in them with those things. Keep us from grumbling and complaining. Keep us from arguing. Keep us from the things that would distract from what your spirit is at work doing. And allow us to shine. For we want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In awe of you and the goodness that you have poured into our lives. And we want other people to recognize that they can follow in this same path. That they too could experience the grace and freedom that we enjoy because of this gift that you've given us. For we ask these mercies in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen.